Welcome to the Skift Podcast, weekly conversations on global travel trend lines. I'm your host, Hannah Sampson. This year, Skift has thought a lot about super travelers, those discerning frequent flyers who travel regularly for business or leisure and have strong points of view about the experience. Research director Luke Bajarski and other staffers here put together a 10,000 word super traveler manifesto that you can find online at skift.com slash super traveler hyphen manifesto. The report includes results from online surveys, insights from focus groups, and one-on-one interviews. We also came up with a list of maxims of the super traveler mindset, which include the need for authenticity and trust in travel advice sources, real rewards versus gimmicks, the right amount of tech and connectivity, and a human element among all that technology. Super travelers also had a voice at the Skift Global Forum earlier this year during a discussion moderated by Luke. On today's episode of the Skift Podcast, we've got that conversation for you. Our panelists were Alexandra Wood, Chief Operating Officer at Wearable Experiments, Jalak Jabin Putra, founder and managing partner of Future Perfect Ventures, Colin Nagy, head of communication strategy at creative agency Fred Farid, and Leonard Brody, an entrepreneur and venture capitalist. They talked about travel pet peeves, the problem with rewards, what makes them happiest on the road, and what they wish the travel industry would figure out already. Here's their discussion, led by Luke Bajarski, as recorded at the Skift Global Forum in New York. All right, so these are the guys that you want to be uh, listening to when it comes to pretty much everything that you do in terms of connecting with the, with the, with the consumer, uh, with the travel consumer. Uh, let's hear a little bit about them. Let's hear about what makes them super travelers, right? The people that actually give a rat's ass about travel and uh, having that active voice rather than the passive voice, those people that only travel once or twice a year. These people do a little bit more travel than that. So let's start with you, Alex. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. So I, um, I end up traveling quite a bit for work. Um, I used to work for a big advertising and media company, and I have to travel across six different continents. So travel's become I'm a, kind of like sport for me. Okay. Sure. Right. Hi, I'm Jalak Jebin Putra. I run an early stage venture capital fund here in New York. Um, have spent my career first in investment banking and then venture capital over the last 20 years, traveling an extensive amount uh, for work, but also do a lot of personal travel, traveled around the world several times by myself, so very much an adventure traveler on, um, on my personal time. I'm Colin Nagy. I work for a creative agency called Fred Farid. Uh, we're in Paris, New York, and Shanghai, and uh, I just spend a lot of time on the road, a lot of back and forth to the Middle East, Asia, Europe, and uh, I also write a column in Skift uh, on kind of customer experience and kind of how travel brands should be thinking about how they talk and interact and communicate with people like us, I suppose. My name is Leonard. I'm an entrepreneur. I've built about four or five companies over the last decade, roughly, mostly in the digital crosshairs between sport, media, and entertainment. I've known Rafa a very long time. And I travel, I do, on average, in the last six years, I've done between 500 and 600,000 miles in the air per year. So I'm uh, stuck in a tube most of my life. Okay. So what is that? Is that out of necessity? Is it out of love? Is it out of pain? Is it, why do you do that to yourself? I just forgot what houses look like, and I just thought that's where you went. Um, no, it's necessity. It's, it's purely for work. So I live between three cities, uh, between London, Vancouver, and Los Angeles, and then most of my work takes me to Europe pretty regularly and to Asia, and then up and down between sort of... The, the worst flights are actually the cross-North American flights are the most difficult from a timing perspective, but it's mostly necessity. It's all work. I actually don't like traveling for leisure. I prefer to stay home whenever possible because I'm on a plane all the time, so I actually do right. very little leisure travel and almost all business. Okay, so out of necessity then, what's one thing that you would change in, in terms of the overall experience, if you could? You, you know, there's so many facets to the, to the journey through travel, whether you're talking about airline or hotel, but, but for me, one of the major touch points that is uh, annoying, particularly in airlines, is actually noise pollution. 
So the airlines are horrible at consistently talking all the time over top. So whether it's, you know, you have to do your PSAs and all that stuff, but just the amount of, that when you're, tra when you're traveling in business and you are on a flight, a good chunk of the people on that plane are doing calls up until the second they're leaving and they're battling against people consistently talking over them, over the airway. So it's, for me, it sounds ridiculous, but one of the big challenges I have on the flight side of it is just the noise pollution is immense. Right, that makes sense. Makes sense. Colin, what about you? My personal favorite is when I can't sleep because flight attendants are bitching in front of me. On the <laughs> which happens a lot. Um, but I think the big thing for me is uh, it's not necessarily related to the actual onboard product. It's just I spend so much time sitting in traffic trying to get to Kennedy. So I look at cities like Hong Kong and Zurich, you know, Stockholm, places, even, you know, London Heathrow Express, like places where it's very easy for like a business traveler or leisure traveler to like get to the airport quickly. Um, I'm just aghast at the state of like infrastructure it here. Um, and, and that's like the biggest friction point because it's in aggregate, it adds up to like a lot of time. And okay, so, uh, so some of those things, we can't, sometimes we can't really control the airlines or the hotels. It's, it's not something, some of those aspects are completely out of our control. Is there anything that um, those brands can do to, to help, help you across that, take, making those steps? I think what you're finding is that when you're actually arriving at the airport, um, airline brands that are, that are making the check-in process a lot smoother and kind of removing, like once you get through like the hell that is getting to the airport, like they're doing a good job at kind of like expediting people through. That combined with you know, pre-check actually makes that friction point solved nicely. So that's one thing they can control. Yeah, I mean, I, just on, on that point with um, Delta One in LA, I, I find you know, fantastic because they have their own entrance um, you know, and, and they check you in. I mean, I, I actually um, was just there and, and I had something that was too much liquid and I had to come back through security. They found a box for me, they packed it up, and I could just go. And so it's that kind of service for frequent travelers that, you know, I, I think is really valuable. Um, Alec? Yeah. I think for me, a big pain point has honestly been around the complexity with um, rewards programs. So because I travel so much, I've accrued all these miles and different like levels of status, which is really great. But then when I go to try to redeem these rewards or understand what they would get me, I, I'm kind of floored. I don't know what, um, what, what I'm getting for all of these points. So I think if there's a bit more simplicity around that, um, that aspect, it'll remove kind of overall friction from that. Right. I mean, I go to flyer talk when, I'm totally. about, when I want to redeem miles. And, and I mean, that's not the most efficient way to you know, search for you know, what, what's the best way. And I, I also find, you know, as much as I like Delta for certain things, I mean, I'm a Delta frequent flyer, um, the redemption, you know, it's 50,000 miles now uh, to redeem to go to the West Coast. And, you know, it, it's, you, it, it's just so much more difficult and, and, and a lot more to, to redeem these miles. So we're accumulating all these miles, but using them, and I do do a lot of leisure travel, or use, using them is, is, is challenging. The, the, issue, the issue, honestly, like whether it's hospitality or whether it's air, the issue is onboarding. And the airlines and the hotels have traditionally done terrible jobs. So at, at Anschutz, where I was uh, chief digital officer for a long time, we owned a lot of hotels. And we spent a lot of time talking about with the, the flags that that ran the buildings for us about the onboarding experience. And it was so poorly thought out and is still relatively poorly thought out because that, that friction, forget about, tech, forget about technology, but just the ability to have a simple email or phone relationship with somebody a day, two days before they're arriving so that that room experience is much easier when they, when they cross that threshold. Onboarding is very poorly executed by hotels typically and even worse by airlines. Although the one airline I would encourage you to, to look at, and I'm not just saying this because I'm Canadian, but if you look at Air Canada, I have flown pretty much every flag carrier that you can fly on and there is very rarely an airline that has got their, their frequent traveler experience down as well as Air Canada has done. Right. I mean, right down to having a concierge system for their higher travelers. So when my flight is late, I get a phone call from the concierge well before trip, uh, 
trip it or any of the notifications come in. They're well on top of it. They're there greeting you at the plane. It's a really, really, as good as you can make it, Air Canada has done an incredible job of making that very seamless. You know, one of the, one of the uh, 10 maxims that we came up with uh, for the super travel is, traveler is that super travelers want real rewards and that uh, gimmicks will only breed discontent and disloyalty. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I think there's a certain element of personalization, not maybe hyper-personalization, but just an understanding of what I value. And then if you, if you give me a reward that's in line with what I value, that's a win. But then if you're then just kind of throwing a reward at me that has nothing to do with me, that's then a distraction. I get infuriated, and that totally backfires. I keep getting um, drink vouchers on Delta. <laughs> I mean, if they, if they, if they knew me, as a, as a consumer, they know yeah. that, you know, I, rare, I, I usually don't drink on flights, right. and I'd rather have something that's, that's more valuable, um, especially as a frequent flyer. Um, I mean, I invest in machine learning and, and blockchain and, you know, data technologies for a living, so um, it's frustrating to see how far behind the travel industry is, um, even more far behind than you know, say the financial services industry, which is pretty far behind in, in terms of personalization and using data and interoperability. Um, you know, I think I was talking to someone backstage about how you know, a lot of the, the um, industry is on mainframes. And, um, you know, when we're getting used to personalization um, in every other aspect of our life and, and um, travel, which is such an, you know, for a lot of us, a very essential part of our lives when we can't have that same personalization is pretty frustrating. Right, I think Colin has a lot to, had a lot to say about <laughs> Well, I think a lot of, I mean, just in terms of rewards, a lot of it is Lucy with the football, right? It's like, it's very confusing. Like, you're just like, oh, I have this awesome thing. Whoops, no, there's an exception. And I think that that's, that ends up being uh, a bit of a pain. But I think to your point, um, sometimes it's the interplay between very simple data, a little bit of tech, and then placing that in the hands of like a capable human who's like the last, the last kind of meter. Cool. And, and I think that that is where, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel and like big data and all of this stuff, like that's great, but sometimes it's like just knowing that I'm arriving earlier than I typically do and, and then having some sort of like intuition, like that's the type of magic that I think if we see that at scale and we see that replicated with like bigger chains, I think that that's kind of what people want as opposed to like, here's a coupon for like a drink that you're not gonna drink, like bad Chardonnay in a lounge, so, you know. I, I, would, I would give you a total contrarian view. I actually don't care about rewards at all. It's meaningless to me. Well, to me, you don't travel for leisure. Or, well, but, right? but even, so. if, uh, even if I did, my points, Whatever I have, I, I usually, I'll donate them, I'll give them away, I'll give them to friends and family, I'll give them all to you if you want. But the, 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 rea the reality is, to me, for a super traveler, for somebody who's traveling three, 400,000 miles, giving them points is like giving a guy who just won a hot dog eating contest a free bunch of hot dogs. It's like, it's not that, it's not that helpful. I don't, you know, I don't wanna see a plane. I don't, like, so for me, the reward is get the experience right. Make, make my journey and my time easier, make it a great experience, that should be the reward. I don't want the payoff after, I want the payoff during the experience, and that's where less time is spent focused. And so, do, do I care, uh, I, I mean, it's nice to get the points and it's nice to be able to have currency to do stuff with, but I would much rather reverse engineer that currency into something that's valuable on the day of, on game day, when it really matters and you're, clients are yelling at you and your kids are yelling at you and you're trying to get stuff done and you're, you're, you're sad because you're away from home. Like those, are, those are the real touch points, moments that they have to get right. And, and points just don't, and rewards don't get at that. Hmm. It's, it's not a, it, to me it's, a, in, it's an inefficient and inappropriate payoff. So, I mean, I think this is an example of personalization, though, because I still think, you know, I think there's some people who would care about rewards sure. and, and, but knowing you know, what's important to some of your best customers is, is what really matters. And, you know, you can't just generalize, um, you know, that drink vouchers matter to everyone or no rewards mm -hmm. matter to everyone. I, I think it's just figuring out, you know, who that customer is. Right. And that goes back to onboarding. It, it really, like, it, to me, it is, it is all about really understanding the moment you leave your home, the week before, 
what the, and, and we're at a stage now, both technologically and from a customer service perspective, where any hospitality industry should be able to do that and do it pretty effectively. Yeah. Right. What I find really interesting is in, in cases where there's like such a, there's a focus on rewards, oftentimes it's just so that I get a decent experience, so that an airline or a hotel treats me like a human being. So I, I'm going to get to diamond medallion because then maybe someone will be nice to me. So if... Well, sometimes. Right, sometimes. Right. So in cases where that experience is already there, and so there's a, there's a travel brand that I really love, a hotel that I stay at, that has no rewards program whatsoever, but I'd stay there nine times out of ten because the experience is one that um, is personalized to me or like my, my demographic, um, and like it, it feels great to stay there. Right, so in terms of loyalty points then, loyalty programs, very much a double-edged sword it seems like, right? So loyalty for the sake of loyalty is, uh, is a, uh, it could be, a, could, could be a dangerous thing. And it's also something else to keep track of, right? So it, it's, and, and they kind of hope that you forget about it. <laughs> okay. So it's not useful. Okay. So, so what about once you get there, right? With the accommodations, there's so much, um, I think there's a lot of confusion in terms of how we, uh, how we market to people these days. Is it authenticity? Is it, um, you know, blending all these different concepts? Do you think that accommodation providers specifically, and I'm directing this question to Colin because we were talking about it backstage, but do you think that they do a good job in connecting with you? It just depends. I mean, some of the ones that you like log enough time with, uh, they, you know, the two that stand out to me are like the Park Hyatt in Tokyo and the Upper House in Hong Kong are, are two hotels that like every single interaction with them is like pitch perfect. And, and it's like, I, I wish that in other instances and other kind of experiences, like that was more of a standard, but they're definitely like the exception rather than the rule. Um, but yeah, I think that a lot of people, what I'm finding is everyone's trying to do backflips with data and like digital experiences and like sometimes that can be useful, but it, it really is, it really is just kind of like the core of executing like hospitality very well and recognizing someone when they come back in and getting like the small things right, especially within like 20 minutes of like check-in, which I always kind of joke about and like it's a common thing in the industry. It's like if you get everything right with, to your point, that onboarding or, ch or, or checking in and removing friction from that process, like you're willing to overlook other things. Yeah. But if that's a nightmare, like every scuff on the wall is like 10 times bigger and like every third phone ring that goes unanswered, I'm like, you know, so, so there's, there's just blocking and tackling, especially with like the good hotels that if they, they get that right, they don't need to have some vast data profile on me and they don't need to like, you know, chase me around the internet. They just, it's like execution and some recognition. Right, I mean, the worst is just waiting, getting off a long flight and then waiting to check in. Totally. <laughs> I mean, that's something that can be taken care of pretty, pretty easily. Um, I mean, I remember staying at the mash mansion on Turtle Creek. Um, I was doing, when I was a banker, I was doing a deal there in the mid-90s. And uh, every time I returned, they, they knew exactly, almost exactly when I was getting, and, and this was pre-smartphone and pre-cell phone, but they kind of knew when I was going to get there based on previous patterns of when I would fly in from New York. And um, after a while, they had, um, you know, my favorite meal waiting for me, uh, whether I'd requested it or not. Um, and I mean, that was so long ago, and I feel like because of profit pressures and, you know, chains taking over, I mean, that, even that little bit has, has gone away, and we actually do have the more data tools, too. You know, even if it's a, a couple notes, right, that someone makes in the system about, you know, what your preferences are. So, um, I mean, I, I rarely encounter that level of service any, anywhere in the world. I mean, Park Hyatt is one, and uh, St. Regis in Mumbai is, is, is pretty good about that. Yeah, we've heard that, we've heard that throughout the last couple of days, execution, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's humans wanting, like humans right. desiring Service. to go for like an A on the paper. Right. You know what I mean? Which, which it's actually that, that subtle desire. And I think we, I love reading how Danny Meyer runs his businesses because so much of it is like the type of people you hire and the mindset of the people you hire. So it's like that's the, that's the missing alchemy that can't be replicated by like big data or like, you know, some fancy app. But, but there, is a, there is an, I've heard a lot of the hoteliers talk about 
their teams and how important they are and the staff. And, and th there is a very fine line between being friendly and welcoming and being genuine. And, and that is a very rare breed. It's very rare, I find, to walk into a luxury hotel or a business hotel where the staff are just genuinely at ease, real people, friendly and cool. It's often a facade, it's often the fake smile, it's just not, it's not a good vibe. And, and, and honestly, there are many of these hotels that overtrain and they take away the authenticity of their staff and the genuineness and the best, I'm sounding very Canadian, but the, I, I, the best experience that I have ever had in my life from a travel perspective is the Fogo Island Inn in Fogo Island. And if you ever have an opportunity to go there, you should go because it is one of the most incredible hospitality experiences you will ever have in your life. From, from the design of the keys to the second you walk off the boat to, and just very genuine, very authentic, very personalized. I mean, Zita Cobb, who runs the resort, basically saved this little fishing island by, by building this resort on it in this very modernist, beautiful resort. And she should not be running a hotel. She should be running a hotel school because it, it's way better than any of the luxury hotels I've ever stayed at. Incredible experience. Alex? I think what, what often gets overlooked, and this is not just the travel industry, it's kind of any big legacy industry, is actually the tools that you give employees to do their jobs effectively. So there might be a big focus on uh, how, how great the experience is in the airline app, but then you go up to the, to the counter and you realize this poor airline employee has to go through 50 screens to figure out who you are, where you're flying. I think, and, and that causes frustration on their end and then you, you then feel the, the effect of that. So I think there also has to be some work done um, kind of to the points made earlier to kind of power these, empower these um, hospitality employees with the tools and the data that they need to then deliver that exceptional customer experience. Do you blame the, do you blame the employee or do you blame the brand? I blame the brand. I mean, yeah, I mean, the like, employee, right. I, I, I'm account, always right? changing my flights and, um, you know, I don't usually go for the, the most expensive. So um, I always, I have to wait, you know, another five, 10 minutes to see if they can refund my change fee. And they almost always do, but it's still that process of, you know, maybe talking to one or two supervisors. Yeah. And, and if that employee could, you know, pull up, okay, well, mm -hmm. I mean, or knows that I'm one of their frequent travelers and, and, and they make this exception almost every single time, but it's still waste some time on the phone to do it. Um, right. Well, for an industry that's, obsessed with efficiency, right? Where it's like the, the joke about taking the olive out of the salad saved someone like billions and millions of dollars. Like, and again, this is utopian because I know Sabre and what's required of it and everything. But like, if you take the time wasted on someone clattering away at a keyboard, and you're like, what are they doing? Right. <laughs> are they solving cold fusion or are they moving me to an aisle seat? And God, and God um, forbid, God forbid. And, and again, this is utopian because I know that they have to use it, but, but it's like, if you, if you could consolidate that into like 30 seconds, um, there's some efficiency for you, yeah. so. Right. right. So Leonard, what's, what brand gets you? I, I'm very curious, where do you stay when you travel because you're, is it at different places every time, or do you have your go-to brands? Um, I, I usually stay at the same places. So if I'm in London, I stay at the same place, and I'm usually at the same place in, in L.A. Um, the, and they're usually either independent or small chain. So f for, for me, from a philosophical perspective, I'm very committed to the Dorchester group of hotels. I stay wherever they have a property, I'll stay, just because they're very good at... Uh, I find they're better at onboarding than most. Still not the best, as every you know, as everybody has to strive to be better. But but I usually stay there. But uh, I do. I am a bit of a, uh, a hotel whore. I will go to the new hotel when it opens because I want to check it out and I'm interested and in look and feel. But I usually rarely will go back in, unless it's significantly and demonstrably better. But I usually have those go tos and I'll stay. And and it's it used to be. I, I won't name the the chain of them, but there was a, one of the large luxury chains that I used to stay at in every city. And I would give them 200 room nights personally, let alone with my company a year. Mm -hmm. And we had this ridiculous conversation over and over again where they would say, they didn't have a loyalty program and I didn't care, but I was just curious why. And I said, because our loyalty program works in the background. It works in the background. What does that even mean? And, the, and then they were telling you, because we know everything about you, but then they would never know. Like you would show up at a hotel in Seoul, and they would never know who you were. And i just given up on it. It was enough, and I figured you weren't getting the benefit. So for me, it's just about consistency. Right. 
college? I think um, of the hotels that I think are great or the chains I think are great. Um, you know, it's not a chain, but I mentioned Upper House, which is fantastic, and they have a few other hotels, Opposite House and Water House. Um, it's owned by Swire. And then I really think that the Peninsula is a very elegant chain that always like delivers pretty well for me. I think that the old, the old Mandarin in Hong Kong is a favorite. Um, and then for a general brand, I would say I do like Park Hyatt a lot. Um, I used to stay at the, the St. Regis, but I kind of found them slipping a lot. Um, and I'm trying to think, and I agree, sometimes I'll just find, go on tablet or like via word of mouth and find like the smaller, interesting off the grid option. Um, and sometimes that leads to delight. Sometimes that leads to, you know, despair, but it's worth, <laughs> worth trying, right. you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, I've seen consistent, consistency slip um, in recent years with, with the chains. So I, I, I really try to find uh, boutique hotels, um, especially if I'm there for work. I, I usually you know, want to know the general area I want to stay in, and then I'll see um, what boutique hotels are available. I mean, I'll you know, default to SPG if I, if I have to, but um, uh, yeah, I, it's just I can't count on a Ritz being the same, you know, um, or Hyatt being the same around the world. So it's it's not, right. you know, worth having this impersonal experience when I can have a more personal experience. Right. Alex, final thought. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty much the same on the boutique hotels, but I think one name that doesn't probably come up as often um, is actually Soho House. Mm. Um, so I try to stay in any Soho House, uh, like hotel property they have in any city because there's a certain element of like getting the little things right that they've nailed down to making sure the Wi-Fi is the exact same in every hotel so I don't have to ask for the code each time. Um, there's a flat iron in the bathroom so I don't have to pack one. The, um, the types of products that they, they provide are ones that um, fit my lifestyle. So I think right. uh, that chain is kind of like the unsung hero of boutique hotels. Right. All right, so just, uh, just kind of summarizing some key themes. Um, uh, consistency and execution, um, true loyalty. Um, what else, guys? I think a lot of people, what I'm seeing is like people that would, in a previous generations, be like hyper loyalists are kind of turning into free agents mm -hmm. in terms of not always staying with the same thing or flying with the same airline, especially as like, things are being eviscerated or the standard isn't the same as you were saying, you're, you're starting to see people that should be kind of like locked into a brand just being like, eh, I'm just gonna go with the flow a little bit more. And one last note, I mean, just offer some vegetarian meals. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just flew back yesterday uh, from Amsterdam no, in, in business. No, no vegetarian option uh -huh. available. And like, that's just ridiculous in this day and age. <laughs> Leonard's kind of like. Mm. I, listen, I, I read, I, I thought the, the manifesto that Rafat and, and you guys did was amazing. I read it and also realized I'm a horrible human being in reading it because I'm <laughs> the polar opposite of everything on there. I think it makes total sense. For me, it's, it's not, and it goes back to personalization. Like, I actually don't want to talk to people when I travel. I don't want to talk to people at the front desk. I just, give me my key, don't look at me, and let me go to my room <laughs> and, and be alone where I deserve to be alone. You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do that stuff, so I, I think that's the point, is that everybody's very different, and it's very hard to, uh, to get those perspectives, but in this day and age, it's really easy. And you should be very, you should be able, as, at a front desk at a hotel or an onboarding experience in an airline, to be really clear, not just a preference checklist where somebody has to say, I really don't like people and I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> like, you, you, you should be specific <laughs> enough. I wish I was kidding, but anyway. <laughs> it, it, be specific, specific enough to know this person has just arrived from Amsterdam and be able to greet them in a way to know they're probably tired, they're probably jet lagged. Like that info is basic. You should know that stuff. And all of the preferences around work preferences and where they like to sit, all those things are great. And the way hotels deal with it now is they'll put you on a VIP list, which is, which is a very old school, I don't know if you know these VIP lists, but there's now different grades on VIP lists. So, and basically at the nine o'clock staff meeting, your picture is shown around and they have to recognize you by name. And that's about it. It's like, listen, 
nobody, I mean, some people care, I guess, but like, it's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be more than that. And it's inexcusable in a date where you have very sophisticated, easy systems or just creeping on Facebook where you should be able to know these things very early on. Right. Really. I feel, I feel like the standard is just so much higher and people are not comparing their experiences among different travel and hospitality brands. You're comparing it to all other like platforms. So the fact that Spotify knows what type of music I like in this playlist every right. week, my hotel should be able to know right. what my preferences are. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, you heard it from uh, the, the horse's mouth. Listen to these people uh, next time. Uh, so Hopefully thanks. it didn't We're, sound too bitter. I know, I know. <laughs> it gets yeah. to the positive. Sure, they have plenty yeah. of good yeah. things to say, too. Um, uh, oh. But uh, round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that was the Super Traveler panel at the Skiff Global Forum. If you like what you hear from the Skiff Global Forum 2016 in New York City, there's more coming. We're holding our first ever Skiff Global Forum Europe on April 4th in London. Find out about this and other events at forum.skift.com. This show was produced by Ben Glowey, who can be found on Twitter at visible underscore sound. Assistant editor Sarah Enlow provided additional support. To subscribe to this podcast, search for Skift on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please leave a rating and a comment to help other listeners find us. Past episodes and a link to subscribe are online at podcast.skift.com. And this has been the Skift Podcast. Thanks for listening.